I sent that and then uh, I went to bed and probably slept one of the best nights I had because I felt that finally we were going to we were going to take a certain level of control that would permit us to do so much more. The cable arrived in New York at the UN's peacekeeping department, then run by Kofi Annan. And the fax uh, came in, and uh, uh, General Dale had also been in touch on the phone with General uh, Baril. Uh, and in fact, he has sent other messages where he sometimes is questioned that the, somebody came and gave me this information. I don't know how, how sincere it is, whether I'm being manipulated or not, because intelligence can also be used to manipulate you. Hanan was skeptical. In his response, he ordered Dallaire, first, not to take any action, and second, to share the informant's secrets with the Rwandan government, which he knew had strong ties to the Hutu extremists. Why did we go that route? Uh, often sharing, shining light on these things and telling those planning it at the governmental level, that the international community knows what is being planned. We are monitoring, we are going to deal uh, with you harshly and we know what you're up to. Sometimes it's a very good deterrent. Anand told Dallaire he was not to raid the arms caches and he must avoid any action that might cause UN troops to use force. The big hammer at the end of the message uh, that came to me within hours of my sending my information message was stop decease and by the by you're totally outside of your mandate. At that time the whole philosophy was we don't want another Mogadishu and so keep it tight. Mogadishu. Three months earlier when the Black Hawks were shot down in Somalia and 18 American soldiers died on a UN mission it changed everything about Washington's commitment to peacekeeping, especially in Africa. The Clinton administration was brought to its knees by the, by the problem in Somalia. A secretary of defense was fired, a presidency was dramatically weakened. Uh, they were enormously criticized for this adventure in Somalia. And now you had another situation unfolding in, in Rwanda and certainly no one was clamoring for a re-intervention into the heart of Africa. Despite the growing sense of danger, Kigali was teeming with thousands of Western expatriates, diplomats, aid workers, and their families. The official line from the UN and all their embassies was that Rwanda was still safe. It was strange because on the one hand, here's um, little groups of eight UN soldiers fully decked out, you know, with all of their gear and their machine guns and everything, patrolling the city of eight, you know, and, and we used to joke, you can't, you can't spit without hitting a UN car. And so you got all this white vehicles, black UN all over them. And, and occasionally you would see some white tanks or something. There was an incredible sense of security in that. And yet we also knew things were gonna blow. Hutu extremists were now confident the UN would not stand in their way. They imported thousands of machetes, prepared death lists, and began targeting their political opponents. It became simply a nightmare for the Tutsis, for all of the members of the opposition parties, even if they were Hutu. And we lived through a series of political assassinations almost on a daily basis. Every day, Every day God gave us, we had three, four, five dead bodies, people that we picked up on the streets every day. And people tried to tell us and tried to explain to us or help us understand, but we just, maybe we just didn't get it. It was just very hard to conceive of something so awful, actually being 
meticulously planned and carried out. In central Kigali, a group of friends gathered for dinner at the home of a young American diplomat, Laura Lane. We had a couple friends over and, um, you know, I just, we just sat down to dinner and all of a sudden there was a huge explosion. And I, I didn't instantly, you know, come to me what that was because I wasn't used to hearing those kinds of sounds. And then at 8.30, the first phone call came in, saying that there, originally the first phone call said that there had been a big explosion in Kanombi Camp, which is just at the end of the runway of the airfield, the Kigali uh, airfield, um, saying that it looked like an ammunition dump had exploded. And it went from there's been a, an explosion at the airport to we think it's the ammunition dump at Kanombi that's blown up to it's a plane that's crashed to it's the presidential plane that's crashed. Someone had fired a missile that shot down the Hutu president's airplane. Even 10 years later, the responsibility for the attack remains a mystery. There are many theories as to who shot down the plane. I don't know if anybody has the answer to that. Was it Hutu extremists or was it Tutsi extremists? Was it done by the Tutsis as an excuse to, to begin uh, the movement south by the RPF and take control of the country? Uh, hard to say, or was it used by the Hutu extremists to begin the genocide that, that took place? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. That night, UN commanders were summoned to a crisis meeting at Rwandan Army headquarters. We were heading through very darkened streets in Kigali, very quiet streets. There was no one. The streets were just empty. It was like a ghost town. They found a leading Hutu extremist, Colonel Theonest Bagasora, in control. Colonel Bagasora was the chef de cabinet of the Minister of National Defense and, and a hardline person, in fact, uh, uh, considered even more than hardline. He was chairing the meeting. Bagasora had once vowed to launch an apocalypse against the Tutsis. Dallaire insisted he step aside and hand power to the moderate acting prime minister, Madame Agath. Dallaire knew she would resist the extremists' power grab and appeal for calm. Bagasora uh, kept saying that she is of no use. Uh, she never was able to garner her cabinet anyways. And uh, an officer that was sitting next to me stunk a booze. Um, uh, started swearing in French underneath his breath about her and calling her various names. And um, uh, so we were stalemated. Dallaire asked UN headquarters for guidance. They responded by tightening his rules of engagement. He was ordered not to intervene, and above all, to avoid armed conflict. We were concerned, one, that um, uh, uh, Dallaire and his uh, force didn't have the capacity and didn't uh, to take on that sort of responsibility, and that if they attempted to do it, and any of the peacekeepers who are killed, we may see a repeat of uh, Somalia, and we may not even be able to offer any assistance. You heard gunshots, you heard screams, you heard, you heard, um, just so much activity that um, you knew this was going to be, you know, an awful night. And in, in the darkness, you were just, I, I remember feeling like, I don't want, to, I don't want the daylight to come because I don't want to see knowing what I'm hearing. 
Well, what's going on here, huh? We got all the kids in the hallway and the television. This is April 7. It's about, it's about 6 o'clock in the morning. And uh, we were woken up at about 5.15, 5.20 um, by a lot of gunfire and stuff. Yeah, the killing was happening right there. Our kids were listening in We, while well, they're describing on the radio and I'm talking back to them and saying how people are being killed in their front yard. And, and I'm saying we're trying to get help and we're just trying to figure out what we can do. This whole drama's unfolding and our kids are standing there glued to this thing. And all of a sudden I go, whoa, I see, you know, one of them standing there and just transfixed. And I say, Teresa, take them away. <laughs> 